Uh, right. My name is Bill Watts. I'm a, um, a, a partner at Max Fordham LLP, which is a firm of consulting building services engineers. And before I talk about the Sahara Forest Project, which I was a, a founding part, um, um, member of, um, I'd, I'd just like to say that thank you very much for Philip to invite me here because um, I am very interested in vertical farming. This isn't much to do with vertical farming, but I do believe that the, uh, the urbanization of biology is something that we really need to understand. And uh, while I know quite a bit about buildings, I don't think we know near, I know nearly enough about the academic side of plants. And the, the, the pulling of those two things together, I think, is a really exciting aspect of um, engineering as much as it is biology. And getting people to understand that linkage is, is exciting in its own terms. So anyway, that's, um, that's sort of who I am. Um, the Sahara Forest Project is an idea, uh, it's an initiative, it's an environmental initiative um, that started up about three years ago, I suppose. And the partners that we're working with at the moment is Exploration, who um, Michael Paulin, who we've mentioned before, is the director of uh, Exploration, and Bologna. Bologna are in a Norwegian environmental organization that uh, is about 25 years old. They were raised on the back of chaining themselves to um, oil valves and things like that. So they're in the environmental protest movement, but they really wanted to do something positive, and so they joined up with us to form the Sahara Forest Project, and you'll see uh, the effects of that uh, later on. Now, the, the, the basic concept of the Sahara Forest Project is to address the issues that we've been hearing about, uh, shortage of food, the fact that we're not going to have any fossil power, uh, the fact that we're running out of water, also how do we get cooling, um, the carbon sequestration is something that we're talking about in, in the soil, perhaps. Now, the provision of food and power and water quite often uses up land, and that's in quite often in direct conflict with biodiversity. So somehow we need to make all those things, uh, pull all those things together. So our concept is to rather simplistically use the sun, which in desert areas you've got quite a bit of, seawater, which you've got quite a bit of in certain desert areas, mix them up in a variety of synergistic processes and make all those things. And I've just added in nutrients because I forgot about it, uh, but it is quite important, uh, as I'm sure every smart biologist will tell you. Um, now the engine for all of this is the evaporation of water vapour from seawater. So basically, if you start off with something hot and dry, uh, some air which is hot and dry. Sorry, this is a psychometric chart for those who might not have seen it. We've got dry bulb temperature along the bottom, which is the temperature you'd see on a, on a thermometer that you've got on the wall. And this is the, uh, the moisture content of the, the air. And as the air gets hotter, it can accommodate more moisture in it. So, the, um, so that's why these curves go up like that. Now, if you humidify the air, um, it basically gets cooler and more humid. And that's, that's the deal when you evaporate water. Um, and if you do that with seawater, um, the same effect occurs. So that is how a pad and fan greenhouse, would, which is probably what you're all aware of, works. If you <coughs> run water over this Munter's pad, pull air through, and your crop line is here, the air heats up and you exhaust hot, humid air. Now, what we're doing um, is rather than using fresh water, which is quite a precious resource, we're actually using seawater. Uh, now, uh, what we've done is model uh, how well this will work in different climates. And so this, this has been done really in the absence of too much horticultural knowledge, but basically thinking, well, <coughs> plants like to be in this sort of zone between, um, that's about 18 degrees and a maximum of 32 or something, but it re they really like to be down here in the green zone, which is um, 18 to 20. That's a sort of European envelope. Now, in Qatar, it's quite a bit hotter than that. Every one of these dots, the blue dots, is a, an hour um, during the day uh, throughout the whole year. And what uh, Fordham's have done is modeled that to see what sort of an effect the evaporative cooling can have. 
and at a, an insulation rate of 800 watts per square meter, if these, all these dots can be projected out that way, um, these areas can fall into a green zone, these areas will get you into a yellow zone. So it's still in, in, a, in the growing, growing environment. And the red zones are areas where we, we're, we're in trouble. Now actually what I've just learned today is that we could afford to drop that 800 watts a meter squared during the middle of the day um, because we would be um, uh, busying up, we'd, need, we'd have too much light so that actually the, the amount of heat we need to deal with would need to reduce so we could actually uh, drop these temperatures um, a bit so that we can uh, reduce the stress. <coughs> this has been done in um, our partners uh, called Sundrop Farms in Australia have used seawater in this technique uh, to produce um, crops. They've been doing it, it's very successful. They've just, that is 2,000 square meters, and they're now um, in the process of building eight hectares using this technology. That's in Port Augusta, which is um, a very sunny, uh, but very arid, and using seawater. Now, um, we are, so this is a design that we've got, we've seen this before. Um, uh, Philip mentioned the, um, the, the project in Qatar. This is something that was made by um, VDH, are going to be making the greenhouse, and it is, is a section through it. Um, and you can see that w what we're doing here is we're blowing the air, rather than having a pad. The pads, the vacuity pads are on the other side of this plenum. Um, and the, the, the fans are drawing the air into these uh, tubes, these air tubes. So we're pressurizing the greenhouse, so any, um, uh, rather than depressurizing it, so that it, any movement of air is, is outwards, so you're not pulling in any uh, untreated air or, or pests. That's another view of it. Um, the other thing that we're doing in this, this particular greenhouse is that um, this is a double skin. Um, for comparison purposes, this is uh, polythene. <laughs> this is ETFE. Yes. <laughs> and this is double layer ETFE. Um, now, what we're doing in this double layer of ETFE is we're using, uh, we're actually humidifying the air in that space at night, using, again, using seawater to create very humid environments up in this void, which projects heat downwards. But this is a very big radiant cooling surface at night. So you'll get condensation at night, and it's a, it's a way of getting uh, desalination. So that's a way of getting fresh water using the cooling capacity of the greenhouse roof at night. Now, the other thing that, uh, the other synergistic process that you can do in a desert where it's very hot and sunny is uh, create um, solar power. Now, concentrated solar power is a process by which you, you gather the uh, sun's energy, you focus it to create very high temperatures, which generate steam, which you can then make uh, power, uh, which you can then, the power can, you can then export as a utility, or you can use it through reverse osmosis to make fresh water. Now, the, the benefit of concentrated solar power over PV was actually, PVs are probably winning on the race of, of um, of pounds per or dollars, probably, uh, per kilowatt hour. Um, but you can store the heat. And storing the heat before it's turned into steam, before it's turned into power, is a very valuable um, attribute. Because it means that you can uh, dispatch the power when you need it, rather than when, it, when the sun is, sun is shining. So that storable nature makes it a, a, a very valuable resource. Now eventually, at the end of the steam process, there's you, within um, a CSP system, you need to reject the heat. Now, the heat rejection for many of these schemes is, is an Achilles heel. Um, if they use fresh water, it's, uh, which is the most efficient way of losing heat, it will, um, A, uh, it, it's very unpopular for the local population because you're just using all their fresh, fresh water supplies to basically evaporate to um, sell low carbon uh, electricity to Northern Europe, which doesn't go down too well. However, if you, the alternative is to use dry air cooling, where you just blow vast quantities of air across these uh, coolers, 
Um, but that costs, there is an energy cost and capital cost of an additional 5 to 10 percent. Using seawater as an evaporative cooling system gives you that benefit without the problem of using up precious freshwater resources. So you've got evaporative cooling, which you can then gives you the potential for um, freshwater recovery from that. Now there are other things that live in seawater. Algae um, is it's a very hot topic. There's a huge amount of money that's being spent on this. Um, this is a facility that was in Hawaii, um, and we're collaborating with uh, the people who uh, set this up. Um, we used to be work with Solana, who are the uh, Exxon or Shell, I think we're, we're running this program, um, and I would, it, it, it's the process is getting there. It's not quite economic yet, but it, it's something that everybody is working on. Now, it's not just algae that lives in um, in seawater, but there are halophytes and other seawater um, um, tolerant uh, higher plants that can live um, above, uh, it, making use of the sunlight and the, the seawater that we make system. So, but all the time, the whole process here, this is, this is the, um, the seawater gradient which we are having to create here. All the time we are evaporating, we're taking seawater and evaporating it all the time for various different purposes. Uh, and this is a particular um, arrangement uh, uh, working down the gradient here. We've got the first the first dibs on uh, the seawater at, it, at its lowest salinity is for desalination, and out of that you get fresh water. But there is what you get is a more concentrated salt solution with brine in it. Uh, uh, of um, the brine that comes out of that is six seven percent. Algae ponds, like at the moment, we're assuming that the algae need the, uh, the lowest um, concentrating concentration of salt. And as you go into our greenhouse. The greenhouse mutters pads can take quite high salinities, um, so that the salinity is going from 3% up to 6%, maybe up to 15%. So we've evaporated the, uh, some, some more water there. But eventually it's getting, the uh, salinity is getting quite high, up to 15%. We're worried about what will happen in, in the greenhouse in terms of the scale formation and things like that. And so we're then going into a much lower tech version of the greenhouse. This is an outside cage, which I'll get down to, and then eventually we run the water into a salt pond where the, the final bit of evaporation takes place, and then a pile of salt. Um, so we're hoping to get value from all of those items. The evaporative hedges um, that we talked about, basically we're looking at running the seawater, or the bitterns, well, sorry, the um, quite concentrated um, salt water down here and created by the use, create these somewhat sheltered um, and somewhat cool because you've got some of the cooling there and some of the humidity coming out to create a slightly more benign environment that you would get normally in a desert. Now, the desert isn't a completely barren place and all things need is a bit of help and they will, and these rather opportunistic plants will grow. This is in Jordan, and uh, I think you'll agree that that's, that sort of conformance to one's view of a desert. Um, the water, um, I think it's something like 100 millimeters a year of rainfall. Now what I find interesting about this is that the person who was driving me around was somebody who was working on permaculture, which is focusing what little rainfall there is into little uh, pockets where you can get growth. And what you can see is that the side of the road, um, you do get vegetation because there is the focusing of the runoff for the road into these spaces. So if you take a look at the road, and then I can assure you that isn't irrigated. It's the fact that you have got this additional runoff, so that 100 millimeters a year is sort of accelerated, it is, is concentrated into something else which, um, which makes it worthwhile. There's, a, there's another picture going up the other way. The other issue is enclosure. If you enclose something and stop the goats eating it, then that allows things to, to grow. Now, that is something which we're trying to promote, to take an otherwise sort of fairly barren bit of desert and start getting growth to happen. Um, 
which in, uh, will allow the roots to start to grow. And this carbon sequestration in the soil is something that we're really quite trying to promote. And uh, the use of biochar, which our, our friend Philip is talking about, is, is an essential aspect of that. And we're learning how essential that is. And then eventually, one gets to the salt ponds. And we're producing quite a bit of salt, actually. So if you've got any thoughts on what you might like to do with some salt, um, be very grateful. Um, this is sodium chloride. This fluid <coughs> here is bitterns, which is a, a, a concentrated form of magnesium chloride. And that's a, a, a very concentrated solution because it, um, you use this bitterns to wash the, the, the salt. And the salt doesn't dissolve. Uh, it, um, it's so concentrated that it stays uh, as, a, as a crystal. Um, but we're using that for ease to turn the tables on this um, process of uh, humidification. The bitterns is a desiccant, and if you, if you run water, uh, if you run air uh, over a pad that's got desiccant in it, it goes the other way. Now, there are some conditions in, uh, in the greenhouse where the air is too humid, and as you know, anybody who runs a greenhouse, that um, very humid conditions can lead to botrytis and things like that. And that is a, something which normally you, you put in a lot of heat to get rid of, but this is another way of, of doing that. So how does it all fit together? Um, well, I've, I've, read, I've talked about some of the aspects, but the idea is to create a synergistic uh, organization of interrelated uh, technologies where one technology fits into another, very similar to the other things that we've, we've talked about today, where everything, uh, Charlie's way of doing it with, um, with the worms and uh, all the other things. So we're trying to do that as well. <coughs> um, we were, to, to, in order for this to be progressed, we were given funding for basically two, from two sources to do some studies. One um, set was uh, Yara, who are the fertilizer company, based in Norway, but uh, are international, and the Qatar fertilizer company, who are based in uh, Qatar, um, paid us to do a feasibility study uh, over there, and uh, the Norwegian government paid us to do some feasibility studies in Jordan. So there were a lot of ideas out there, engineering ideas, which I feel very comfortable with and very exciting as far as I was concerned. Um, and we modeled them thermodynamically, um, we did a lot of reading and um, learning. Um, we built physical models. This is the, uh, what we called the locale that uh, Philip actually built um, out. And you can see the industrial, um, that's Qatar's massive um, urea plant in the background, which we're not allowed to photograph. Um, it would be hard for us for an industrial espionage person to get much out of that, so I think we're safe. <laughs> um, and um, these panels here were, were built by Ian um, uh, uh, and his, his pals at MP. So it was, uh, it was a good effort. These are, these are Munter's pads for those who, who haven't, um, who aren't familiar with them. Now, all these processes, of which there are lots, um, we wanted to see how they interlinked, and we produced a, a, an Uber spreadsheet with probably about 25 tabs, where all the things fed into one another, which ended up being a very powerful computer tool, um, which really demonstrated uh, how you could produce rubbish if you brought rubbish in. Um, and we're now in the process where we've got a tool, but we really need to understand how all the bits um, uh, what all the inputs are so that we can, um, we can get a better idea of it. Um, now one of the big costs of all of this, and I'll come on to the economics, is the cost of the pipeline. Because basically we're taking uh, an area of, of desert and we're bringing seawater into it. So the obvious difference between that and any other um, industrial facility is the fact it's got a pipeline and still water in it. Now this is just to demonstrate that it works best at scale, um, because the cost of a seawater pipeline, a unitized in terms of dollar uh, per cubic meter of water, goes up at a very small, at, 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 at a, if you're only producing 650, pumping 650 meter cubes per day, it's about $2,000 a cubic meter. Whereas you get to bigger numbers, um, the cost drops. 
Now, to put this into perspective, um, it's uh, you'd need that would if it was at this price, it would add about twenty-five dollars per square meter onto uh, the cost of uh, a greenhouse. But you can see that we're trying to the our aspirations aren't small. Um, running a lot of these costs are to do with the pumping power of pushing water along. So economics, um, it depends. If we're producing good quality produce, which commands a high price, um, and we're comparing it to the cost of imported diesel for the energy uh, and used for the power for desalination, and we get some reasonable price for salt, then yes, it is economic. A large part of this was the local consultations, because we're not going to be doing this ourselves. We need to get the buy-in and understanding what the local conditions are. So we commissioned a number of different local uh, experts and consultants to work out what was going on. But this wouldn't have been possible, I'm nearly finished, without... It, it's a, this has been a very ambitious project, which is run at quite a lot of speed, and something that I knew nothing as an engineer. I would not have got this without this sort of level of support that um, the loaner brought to it. Now this, the, this group of gentlemen here um, is the, um, is the CEO of Yara, uh, the CEO of um, uh, Kafko, the Prime Minister of Qatar, and the Prime Minister of Norway. Now that's a sort of, with those people signing that document, they were signing something to say that they're, that, um, they're going to pay for this uh, test and demonstration centre. Now, with those, that with that photograph, they're not going to let us fail, even though this is happening at breakneck speed. There's quite a lot of risk in this. Um, this is being built, courtesy of uh, our friend here. Um, and, um, and, and the sort of money that this needed and the commitment needs to come, and it only comes from the, uh, the political support. Now, just to run through basically what we've got here, we've got algae ponds here, we've got the hedges with the biochar in it, greenhouse, obviously CSP, and we've got salt ponds at the back. Equally in Jordan, it helps if you've got the king on your side. Um, and this is uh, Frederick Hag shaking hands with the king of Jordan. That goes on to some agreements here. And so our vision for Jordan is to create this test and demonstration center, which is going to be a sort of learning resource um, and research center on just north, north of uh, Aqaba. You've got the Red Sea down there. That's the Israeli border. Um, and. Um, that's, that's our ambition. So just to finish off, where are we? Incidentally, this background is what that site looks like now. It's quite flat. Um, and I would say that, to my mind, that looked like there wasn't much on it. But to an ecologist who loves this area, there's a hell of a lot on this. And that the humility that you need to bring to something like that, saying, well, you know, man, I don't know, put it on it. Or uh, the tanks there, it doesn't matter. Actually, we need to be very sensitive that we do it right. And we better watch out for the wadis because every now and again it floods like hell and kills everybody in the way. So you just have to be careful about that. So we've completed the feasibility studies since the time of just recently this uh, uh, a month ago. <coughs> Currently constructing the 1,000 square meter pilot that I showed you in Qatar. And we're looking for um, <coughs> some financial arrangement and funding and things like that to do the 20 hectare site on, on that site. And I mean, finally, I say we, we would enjoy, we, we do enjoy considerable support and goodwill, and that we find that's quite a responsibility because it's quite a bit of expectation that uh, we move forward on something that, um, well, <laughs> um, we, we need that something that needs a considerable network of people to, to help with. 